Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Sketchy Situations. I'm Sketchy, your host, narrator, game master, and generally everything for this channel, where I play Stroke of Luck, an actual play series using Ironsworn Starforge, a game written and designed by Sean Tomkin. I thank you for making it another week, and let's get started. So before you get bored and click away, this episode and previous as well as future ones will have chapters in them now that I figure out how to do it properly. This will happen over the next week or so as I go back to listen to them and I have to add them in manually. If you want to skip all the announcements and go straight towards the story, they will be in the description below. For the next announcement, I'll be switching to bi-weekly uploads just because I have a lot going on during the summer and my personal life is doing some weird changes. I may be able to get more out, but at least now I'll be able to stick to a better schedule just because of that. As long as you have yourself subscribed and the bell selected on YouTube, you'll know when I drop a new video. And finally, last but absolutely not least, I want to say thank you to all of the lovely, kind, encouraging, thoughtful, I think there's a few more words, but I'm running out of them right now, words that were given to me for that one little self-deprecating joke I did on Twitter. In the words that were said, there was a lot of emotion, how everyone feels about trying to share their voice in this rather crowded TTRPG space we're all in. Every last word was counted and I feel like there are a lot of good people in this community that mean you well, want to see us all grow because we're just a bunch of nerds trying to fit in with other really big nerds. Now after the announcements I have a disclaimer. Viewer discretion is advised. This episode contains horror related content and mild jump scares. This includes descriptions of violence, death, and decay. Please be mindful of yourself and your surroundings before proceeding. So recapping our last episode, Aaron Slater and Jura Kwan continue to venture through the mushroom jungle to the infested ship. They avoided a really gnarly arachnid. They shared some choice words with each other and Ghost stumbled upon a cryopod, which sent Aaron into a vision where he was left with the words enemy and power. Now we're going to continue on to our next leg of the journey, which is quite literally only seconds after he's gotten himself back up to his feet. Still standing there wobbly, Jiro asks him, was that a vision? And Aaron realizes he's not in a movie. There was no dramatic transition to a new scene where they're doing new amazing things with this vision he's just had. He's still standing here with Jiro Kwan. And he decides not to answer to try to remain in that fantasy, but Jiro reminds him, you don't need to answer my question, but I still haven't marked the pod. Now they're stuck here for the next couple of minutes while Jiro finishes marking the pod before they can walk off, and the entire mood is just lost. So for the first roll of the show, we're going to undertake an expedition plus edge because they're trying to hurry up. They're losing light. And they need to get to the ship before they're in complete darkness and they have no idea what the local fauna and flora are like in this area at night. So undertake an expedition plus edge, we get a weak hit. That's a seven versus a two and an eight. I still mark progress on travel to the infested ship. We're at eight out of 10 boxes, but let's resolve this weak hit. Forgive me, I'm just finding the Planetside Peril Oracle. I could have done that this whole time. But anyway, I have a hazardous plant life or malignant spores. Okay, I can see this. It's generally sunset by this point in time. They're now in a fully clear area, a little bit in the distance. There's some obstacles that you can't see past, but otherwise they're in a regular field. The low ground is looking a bit dark. You can't see well without a headlamp and they step into this one particular patch that lights up. It just sends the whole landscape glowing all of a sudden, and these tufts start to float up, these glowing tufts, glow spores. And Aaron reflexively swats it away when it starts to get close to his face, but then it gets stuck on the back of his hand. And when he waves his hand again, he ends up getting another one stuck onto his palm. Jiro looks back at him and tells him to put on his mask just in case these turn out to be something dangerous. But before Aaron can 
get his other hand up to put his mask on, this avion creature lands. They can't see it too well, but it lands in the field and sets another patch off into this brightness. But it immediately gets stuck to with tons of the glow spores all over it. It flails around and can't seem to take off again, and it starts squawking and screeching. When it does this opening up its mouth, it starts to hack and choke. This continues while it gets more disoriented, and then it drops. There's a few sad whimpers and twitches, and then finally it doesn't move anymore. By this point, Aaron is staring wide-eyed and horrified. He looks down and he sees that more glow spores have gotten stuck at the edges of his coat closest to the ground. I'm going to roll face danger plus iron because he's viciously trying to get these things off, even though he just watched what that does. And I have here a 5 versus a 1 and an 8, so that's a weak hit. On a weak hit, you succeed, but not without a cost. We're going to make a suffer move. I'm going to make that suffer move minus spirit. That brings us down to three spirit. But I'm going to try to endure it because why not? And when you endure stress, you use your spirit or your heart, whichever is higher. And my heart is a two. And that is actually a strong hit. That's a nine versus a one and a two. That's practically a landslide right there. That's almost as good as getting a match. No, it's not. I'm lying. But on a strong hit, you can choose one of the two. You can shake it off and just take plus one spirit, which would bring me up to four. I am taking that. But the alternative is to embrace the darkness and take plus one momentum. I like the sound of embrace the darkness, but I'm more focused on keeping my spirit up right now. So that's what we're going to do. And let's envision why he was able to recover from that panic moment. I see that while he is waving around like an idiot. Jiro puts his hand on Aaron's shoulder, gripping it just enough to keep him from being able to move around and get his attention. And Aaron looks around at him. He has the mask on now, by the way. And he sees Jiro holding out his other hand where there's a glow spore just stuck to the palm of it. And he squeezes his hand into a tight fist. As he opens his fingers, glow dust sprinkles downward like children's glitter. And it's kind of gorgeous, almost, if you didn't know that this stuff would fill your lungs and choke you to death. He feels absolutely ridiculous when he realizes just how easy it is to destroy these spores. And he looks around the field to see that most of the glow spores float harmlessly into the air, becoming distant dots like stars in the night sky, with short lives twinkling just for a little while in this twilight hour. Jiro gets to have the dramatic walk off and Aaron follows behind. We're gonna make a progress roll now and end this expedition of traveling to the infested ship. This is where we take the amount of boxes we filled as the fixed action score versus whatever our challenge dice roll. And right now I have eight versus an eight and a three. So that just means that I have a weak hit and that's lovely. Before we get real negative about it, we're going to mark progress on retrieve the AI core from the infested ship and finish destiny. That gives us one box because for no reason at all, I made it a formidable quest and I figure it's because it's really dangerous, supposedly. Now reading off the results of my weak hit. On a weak hit, you reach your destination or complete your survey but you face an unforeseen complication at the end of your expedition. That's nothing new, but I have to make my legacy reward one rank lower and envision what I encounter. I could have set it higher so that I can get a higher rank if I end up with a weak hit, but you can go bite cheese. That would have taken forever, as you can see how many episodes it took to just go down the street for me. So on my discoveries track, I have the start of a cute little star for my first box, but that's still only two ticks out of four to make it a complete box. Next up, let's start rolling up some oracles on what this infested ship looks like. We have a derelict planet-side starship. Its name is Dawn's Herald. The condition is simply damaged or breached. The outer first look, it looks like it's sending a signal or a message. That's kind of a weird thing to see on the outside unless someone's painted on the side of the hull, but eh. I'm going to stop the oracles right there because we're just arriving on the outside of this crash ship and we're going to move on to just the starship oracle as to what is the class and the first look. And for class, I have multi-purpose. 
So that sends us to look on to the Starship mission to understand what was this ship being used for at the time. I have provide medical aid. Oh, I love that. Uh, that, that, that creates conspiracies. And the first look, it is refitted or repurposed hull. So this damaged, breached ship clearly has a refitted or repurposed hull. So putting this all together, the Dawn's Herald was a repurposed starship designed for mobile medical services. For unknown reasons, it traveled to the Burning Arch, making its way to the planet Scourge. It was led astray and it crash landed on the planet's surface. I like that. Okay. Last but not least, our most favorite part of playing Iron Sworn Anything is our lovely complication. I'm going to go with the Derelict Access Peril because just before we come in, I figured that's when we're going to run into the danger. And I have a dreadful scene of death and violence. So let's envision this. The fungi of Scourge has a way of enveloping things that don't belong. So when they broke through these new, sudden, taller stalks and saw the Dawn's Herald before them, an enormous gray, black, and rusted brown mass before them, with moss and lichen growing in between the cracks. For what wasn't covered, it was a mosaic of other decommissioned vessels. Like wounds inflicted and healed over, the transition from one vessel to another was abrupt, but still somehow fitting together. Just outside of it is a cylindrical tower, once spinning with a red blinking light. The only thing left is the blinking light, while soft moss has crept into its joints and kept it from turning ever again. While still solar powered without being able to turn, it can't properly send a signal. After taking in the sights, they start to make their way to the hatch door, and Aaron notices that there's lumpy, uneven ground, patches that were pushed up from the impact of the starship. The lumpy patches have already turned into their own garden plots. The only thing that separates the lumpy patches from the rest of the area is just that they're slightly raised up. While walking over these patches, his boot catches on one and he kicks something loose. It falls forward and he focuses his headlamp onto where it falls to. His headlamp picks up a bit of a glint and that's just enough for Aaron to go chase it down to see if there was something valuable. He pulls the mossy covering from it and finds a ring inside, which is awesome. When he pulls at the ring, a finger snaps off. After a stomach turning snap, Aaron yells out and throws it towards the hatch where Jiro happens to be standing at. It falls near Jiro's feet and kind of rolls to where he can see the palm of an old decaying hand facing up at him. Completely unfazed, the hunter turns around and says to Aaron, where did you find this? Aaron looks flabbergasted and then gestures widely. He sweeps his headlamp around and now it's obvious. These lumps are more than just uneven. The shapes are now standing out. The shadows cast off of them. There's three, maybe a suspicious four lumps out here. Then Jiro says, so this whole thing is the crew. Aaron shrugs, probably. Jiro starts to walk back towards him. There's a lot of clues in this mound then. Aaron squints his eyes. We're not digging through this. Jiro tilts his head. I'm not asking for permission. Aaron shrugs and makes his way to the entrance. Then you stay here, in the dark, and play around with dead bodies. Jiro follows, but before they can even reach the first room, there's already another body along the corridor. The smell is mostly dissipated. This is an old scene, and the worst of it has wafted out into the open air that's not too far away and there are things that are growing from whatever had leaked from this body. On cue, Juro lowers himself to the cadaver and begins to inspect it. Aaron hangs close by trying to see what Juro is learning, but he can't see much over him. Finally, after some time has passed, he asks, did you find something good? Juro doesn't answer his question, but he does stand up and nods forward. Let's keep moving. Aaron stares down at the body as he walks past it. There's not enough he can learn 
with his headlamp with a cursory glance. So he shrugs and just keeps following. They end up in some sort of officer's room. There's the expected desk, chair cramped in this tight space, a hollow screen, and a physical map on the wall. Crew probably thought that it was great ingenuity when they put it up just in case they had any power issues or just for the sake of convenience. They probably didn't know that it would be more useful for the people that came after them. The two of them stop and look at this map, trying to figure out their next steps. Aaron is trying to figure out where this AI core could be and has absolutely no idea where to begin to look. Likely it would be in some sort of IT area, but this is a big map. It has a lot of rooms in it. And he can't even begin to imagine the first place to put an overseer, if this is what it is. In fact, the AI core could have gone to anything. That was probably the most unspecific thing that Brennan could have said, AI core. While he's thinking over this annoying fact, Jero speaks up and makes a keen observation. The damage to the ship, as far as he could see from the outside, didn't appear severe enough that the power, or at least backup power, is inaccessible. The plan is to get the power up and going enough so they can get life support going and they can camp in the canteen this evening with clean air. By this point, Aaron is more or less sick of the definitive tone that Juro has. Do this, do that. There's no room for questioning. While he knows he needs this guy's help, he's not in the mood to just do things because someone says so. Call it his nature or his career, but he argues and says, why don't we just divide and conquer? We can get a lot more of this ship done, so tomorrow we can figure out a lot more. I'm gonna roll Compel plus Heart. I feel like it should almost be Iron because he's pissed off and he's not saying it a nice way, but I think he's trying. And I have a four versus a ten and a one, so that just can't that just can't fix itself right there. Juro nods and agrees. You're right. And then he quickly grabs Aaron's wrist slapping a bracelet on it, clicking it into place, and then twisting it around to see a soft green blinking light before letting Aaron go. While Aaron is looking at him about ready to go ape shit, with this smug expression, he says, if you try to leave, I'll know. It's also a communicator, so there shouldn't be any excuses. You don't answer. I'll see you in two hours. There is every bit of the forge held in Aaron's hand as he thinks about slinging this man across the room when Gerald turns his back and starts walking away without waiting for Aaron to actually answer but he decides no there will come a time when that will be needed and oh will it be great when he can do it so we're gonna undertake an expedition plus wits and make this dangerous name it scout the dawn's herald we're just surveying a site and that's a strong hit. I don't know if I did this with the other ones, but I'm going to make sure that I mark progress upon making this roll. And awesomely enough, we can just move on to what is the first place that Aaron runs into. Well, the first thing I have is actually strangely a random thought of Aaron actually wants to go back to the first body that they saw coming in. Not the mound, but the one in the hallway. And he's going to gather information Jiro didn't say anything, but they're not partners, and he doesn't expect this man to actually give him tons of information. So, gathering information, I have a weak hit, which brings us up to seven after the momentum we had gotten from Compel earlier that I forgot to mention. And I'm going to be quick. I'm going to roll a story clue. It says, it connects to a previously unrelated mystery or quest. And just to build on this, I have Toxic Atmosphere. This is a good time for me to bring up the settlement trouble that I honestly don't know anymore why I didn't bring it up, but that was sabotage technology. And I think that goes hand in hand in this situation. This body is well into decay, but it's not damaged from scavengers or really much of the environment itself is actually well-preserved in an enviro suit. And the tubing that connects the breathing aspect to the rest of the suit It was obviously compromised, but they weren't able to see it from the angle they would have been standing at. Aaron doesn't know if Juro had noticed this at all, but this stands out to him definitely. 
There's a lot more going on with this crash than he had considered before. But he wasn't going to crack it open and ask it questions, so what he has here is enough. He went back to the dispatch room and decided to take an adjacent path from which Juro had taken and found himself in a fitness area with busted terrariums wide open for little bits of spores that have wandered into the ship to grab a hold of the vital soil and transform the decayed plant life into new fungi, lichen, and moss. Any other surface susceptible to moisture was similarly showing signs of growth. There were ellipticals, adjustable weight sets, and basic stretching areas. Everything was a bit tossed around from the crash, but otherwise in decent repair. Get rid of the gravesite and the dead body in the hallway and you could probably tack up right here. Except when Aaron squinted, he noticed that the mushrooms that had taken up residence were indeed the glow mushrooms because there wasn't a lot of UV light that got here. If honestly any at all, there weren't exactly a ton of windows in this place. It was a starship after all. He decided to give a test out on the bracelet and calls in to Jiro. Hey, I got some of those shitty glow mushrooms here. Then I advise you to keep your mask on. Which was a quick but rather condescending reply from Jiro. But otherwise, he reports, looks like this happened while they were just relaxing. Found a music player still plugged in. Means there's still some juice on the ship. And Aaron can hear some music in the background. It's actually a genre he enjoys, but then it ends abruptly. 10-4, buddy. Let me know when you fix the problem. For the next leg, we undertake an expedition plus wits. We have a weak hit with a 6 versus a 6 and a 1. So let's envision. It's completely dark at this point. Aaron has his headlamp on, but for what little bit it illuminates, it casts a longer shadow. The only thing he can hear is his footsteps echoing down the length of the corridor. It's a relatively long hallway. And with each step, he starts to move into his old habits, easing one foot after the other. He hardly wants to take too deep of a breath. Then a panel drops and smoke streams from the opening left behind. Aaron isn't fast enough to evade it and is blasted with hot steam. The layers of his clothes are just thick enough to take the brunt of it. And while he's reeling from the onslaught, he hears something scuttling overhead. The hallway is starting to fill with polluted steam, keeping him from seeing whatever might be over his head, behind him, next to him. He decides not to stick around any longer and runs ahead to his next destination. From his wrist, he can hear the buzzing, and when he taps it, no voice comes through. Juro? Juro. Quan. There's just more buzzing as he finally enters the next room. Entering the next room, his light hits a person in a bio suit, leaned over a microscope. Or at least they used to be. They are nearly completely bent over, with the microscope penetrating the face shield and tendrils of black, blue, and red reaching out from the sample tray, piercing through the decayed flesh of the long past researcher. More tendrils reached around the helmet, pulling it closer, leaning it down toward the tray. Other fleshy limbs crept downward along the desk and underneath until fleshy roots could be seen lining the floor underneath the body. Even with his face covered by his mask, he puts his hand over his mouth and backs up towards the door where he can still hear the steaming hiss from the hallway. He beams his headlamp around the room looking for an exit. Reflective surfaces beam back at him until one blinks. Aaron takes his chances then and runs in a random direction, luckily finding another door out of this room, away from the hallway, away from the blinking. He stumbles in the dark until he finally reaches the top of a staircase. It's then when Juro's voice finally chimes in again, clear as a bell as if there was never any static interference. Ghost, ghost, come in. It's the first time that Juro Kwan has used his call sign since he introduced himself, and that's enough to jar him out of his panicked fear. Breathing heavily, Aaron answers, I'm here, I'm here. There was a lot of interference, what was going on? Aaron is sure he heard a few 
distant curses before Jiro speaks up again. I thought I found the breaker, but not sure what I flicked. I turned it off. It does seem to be connected to the ventilation system, but not what I was looking for. There's a drawn out pause and then Aaron just drops laughing. Jiro lets him do this for a minute, then says, you can head over to the rendezvous point now if you would like to. Aaron shakes his head silently, unseen, but definitely felt. Nah, still got time. I'ma check out down here, found some staircase. Also, if you do find ventilation, don't turn it on yet. Think I found a contaminated site. Let's just say mushrooms are the least of our problems in this place. Might need to kill this one with fire. Wouldn't happen to be a pyro, would you? There's a brief silence and then Juro says, I don't want to waste any evidence. I'll see what I can do with it later. Whatever. I'm heading down, so it might be some more interference. Just try not to go switching on everything you find. Going down is the last thing that Aaron necessarily wanted to do, but he also didn't want to think about what was behind him. Maybe this way there was another way up on another side of the ship. We're going to undertake an expedition plus wits, and that's a 6 versus 7 and a 5. As per the norm, we mark progress, and let's figure out what goes wrong this time. Heading down the steps are numerous missing panels, exposed wiring behind it, and just a peek into the inner workings of this ship. Aaron tries not to think about what caused this, except for maybe the crash, where things were just jostled out of place. But with no handrail and no lights, he's a little uneasy with his footing. He makes it down, but a couple of times he nearly lost his balance as he reaches out for the wall and finds a gaping hole there instead. Eventually he reaches solid footing and he sweeps the lamp around to get a good look. He sees an open locker with a few hanging EV suits and rooms lined up completely visible to each other and those looking in with polycarbonate glass. Though of the multiple cells that are here, only one of them is broken open. Aaron paws around the desk that are sitting in front of the cells, looking for anything that could glean further information at what they once held. All the consoles are obviously dead in the water with no power to supply to them, but he happens to find a data shard sticking out. We're gonna roll gather information plus wits, of course, that's the only thing to use, and we have a miss with a match. Well, isn't this spicy? Let's pay the price. A new enemy is revealed. Don't we have enough of those? Well, what makes this enemy special? Suggests an imposter or forgery. Okay, one more bit. How do they reveal themselves? You are tracked or followed. Didn't I roll that the first time I met Brennan Carr? Yeah, I did. And I couldn't figure out what to do with it then. Hmm. Ghost is smart in a lot of ways, but not in a, I went to school for this sort of way. So when he's looking through the data shard, he's looking for plain English things. He finds the basic profile of what was in that cell. It's relatively human sized, a mammal. It features hair coverage or fur, and is known to lure things into traps. There's one last video file on this data shard. It hasn't been tucked away in the other encrypted folders yet. He presses play. He sees the back of one individual. They're wearing a white lab coat. He can't see what's in the cell that's standing in front of it, but a voice says off screen, anything new today? And the person in front of the cell half turns around. No, nothing new, same mimicking behavior. The off camera voice says, what are we waiting for? The person on screen turns back around looking inside the cell to see what it really looks like. At that moment, the lights go out in the facility. Red strobe lights come on as the backup power kicks in. There's heavy shaking. The camera becomes unsteady. Visuals go down, but audio continues to run. The turbulence persists and then slowly eases out into a thrumming hum and some distant clatters. One speaks up between grunts. Are you okay? And the other one is silent and they repeat it. Are you okay? And finally they say, no, the cell opened. It's not in there anymore. But don't worry, it couldn't have gotten far. 
Let's just go find out how everyone else is doing. You don't get it. It's not about where it went. It's who it became. The rest of the video is incomprehensible and filled with distant noises. Eventually, the feed completely cuts as the ship's emergency power dwindled out. Ghost stands there gaping at the screen until it finally occurs to him that he might want to share this bit of information. He raises his wrist and speaks into the communicator. Juro, come in. After an agonizing silence, Juro answers. You're a jumpy one. What's going on? Aaron's heart was leaping too much to even take offense. I found some leftover feed from just before the crash. I'm thinking you might want to see this. Meet me at the rendezvous. Aaron is a bit frazzled, so we're going to finish an expedition at just six boxes. Miss. Okay. Pay the price. Your equipment, a vehicle, malfunctions. Cheryl's response comes in full of static and incomprehensible. Aaron squeezes the bracelet. You're breaking up. Juro. The static on the bracelet silences and the little red light goes out. And behind Aaron, he hears a noise. He spins around to look. But before he can get his headlamp steady, the light flickers and then goes out. All right, so that was a doozy. Thank you so much for a very late but for me, a very fun episode. I had fun stepping out of just a few little things. We have a lot of plot threads that are either being tied together or further strung apart. It looks like this situation is going to get a bit hairy, but if you're looking forward to what's going to happen, if you haven't already, subscribe and hit that bell and find me on Twitter. You can find all of that in the description below. Thanks for the love and stay in trouble.